welcome Nord Anglia and thank you for joining us for our MIT abstract on how food can make us sick with MIT PhD student Jamalix uh, Acevedo Sanchez. I'm your host Fatima Hussein and I'm a graduate student at MIT studying ancient life on earth. Now before we begin I'd like to cue you all in to what an abstract actually is. So an abstract is just a snapshot or a summary of a greater work of research or writing and with this series we're bringing abstracts of inspiring MIT experts straight to you on your screens, wherever you are around the world. So now without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jami to uh, today's MIT abstract and she's gonna tell us all about the work she does in biology. Hi Jami. Hi Fatima, thanks for having me. Of course. All right, I am so excited for your presentation. So I'm gonna mute myself and let you begin. So hi everyone, as Fatima said, my name is Jami. I am a fourth year PhD student in the biology department at MIT. And today I am going to be talking about what food poisoning can teach us about ourselves. Some of you may know people who unfortunately have gotten sick as a result of eating food that has bacteria in it. In those cases, we say this person has a case of food poisoning. I study one of the bacteria that causes food poisoning. Before going into detail about the bacteria I study and how cool I think it is, I just want to talk a little bit about myself. I, call, I come from a neighborhood called San Felipe in Puerto Rico, which is an island in the Caribbean. There I have a very large family. For context, my mother has 17 brothers and sisters and my dad has 11 brothers and sisters. So you can imagine that throughout the year we had multiple birthday parties. And one of the things that we enjoyed doing in those birthday parties was dancing. And I think that's one of the reasons why dancing is one of my favorite hobbies. It makes me feel happy and like I'm close to home. Another thing that I really enjoy doing is eating. So here is a photo of me eating one of my favorite dishes in the world called mofongo, just mashed plantain. Another thing that I enjoy doing is spending time with friends. So here's a photo of some of the friends I've been able to make ever since I moved to Cambridge to study at MIT, and they've truly become my home away from home. And last but certainly not least, something I really enjoy doing is being able to teach and mentor young scientists. So here is a photo of one of the students I was able to teach last summer. Her name is Bailey and she was absolutely amazing. I was able to teach her all of the different techniques that I use in order to study the bacteria that I study. And by the end of the summer, she was an expert. All of this to say that I am more than just a scientist. However, science is a very big part of my life. Ever since I was really young, I was really interested in understanding the why and the how of things. And eventually I learned that there were very small living creatures that we call bacteria that piqued my interest. One of these bacteria is called Listeria monocytogenes. I apologize in advance, as biologists like to give really complicated names to things. So for short, I'm just going to be talking about it as Listeria. So as I was saying, I study Listeria, which is a bacteria that can make us sick. Specifically, Listeria can give us food poisoning. The way that we can get sick with listeria is by eating food that has it in it. And some of the foods, when not treated appropriately, um, that can have listeria are dairy products, deli meats, and vegetables. So essentially, if you eat food that has listeria in it, you might feel sick, feverish, and in really severe cases, you might get headaches, stiff neck. I want to clarify that not everyone that eats food that is contaminated with listeria will get sick. The food poisoning that is caused by listeria mainly affects pregnant women, women, newborns, individuals that are 65 uh, years or older, as well as people that have a hard time fighting off sicknesses. I mentioned that listeria is extremely small, as all bacteria, so we need special instruments to be able to see them. These instruments are called microscopes, and there are different types of microscopes. And using a very specialized one, we're able to see listeria. So in the second image that just pop, pop, popped up, Listeria is these rod gray shaped structures as showcased here. Since I study Listeria, I need to be able to grow it in the lab. And the way that we grow Listeria in the lab is by growing it in these circular plates called Petri dishes. Petri dishes have all of the nutrients and resources that Listeria has in order to be able to grow. And if you take a closer to look, 
at the area that I highlighted in the red circle, you will see a lot of dots. Each and every one of these dots represents millions and millions of listeria. So what exactly can we learn from studying bacteria that make us sick? The first thing we can learn is about the disease itself. We can learn more about food poisoning and by understanding how listeria causes food poisoning, we can develop treatments to treat people that get it. Another thing that I didn't mention earlier is that listeria isn't the only bacteria that can give us food poisoning. There are other bacteria that like listeria can make us sick. So by studying listeria, we can learn more about these other bacteria. Another thing that we can learn from bacteria that make us sick is that we can learn more about our own cells. So our body is made up of millions and millions of tiny units called cells. And our cells have different machines and resources that allow us to essentially be alive. So once listeria reaches the body, it wants to stay alive. So what it does is that it steals our resources and some of our machines in order to stay alive. So by understanding how listeria does this, we can learn more about the resources and machines that our cells use to stay alive. Now, what happens after you eat food that has listeria? So once you eat food, your food process or passes through the digestive system and there the food is processed so that our body can extract the nutrients and meats from it. And finally, the food reaches the gut. And I mentioned that our body is made up of cells. So when listeria reaches our cells, here I'm showing listeria in green and our cells in gray, it can actually get inside of our cells. And once it's inside of our cells, it steals a machine called actin. And what it's able to do is that it's able to form a very long tail that allows it to move inside our cells and eventually allows it to move from one cell to another. I study how listeria moves from one cell to another, as well as the resources and machines that listeria steals in order to be able to move from one cell to another. And so far, I've been showing this in cartoon form, but actually in my lab, we have the ability to take pictures of listeria moving from one cell to another using a special microscope. And these images look like the one I'm showing on the left. So here, listeria is in magenta, and in yellow, I'm showing the outline of cells. We call that a cell membrane. And in cyan, I'm showing the machine that I told you that Listeria steals called actin. And with the arrows, what I'm highlighting is the moment in which Listeria is moving from one cell to another. I mentioned earlier that Listeria is very small. So actually our microscope has the ability to make things 100 times bigger than they actually are. So you can imagine that these things are very, very tiny, but very, very interesting. And if you're having a hard time visualizing what I'm talking about, just think of Listeria as a submarine and think of the cells as the ocean. So think about Listeria as little tiny submarines making their way through our cells. Here, I'm just showing a broader picture of what listeria moving from one cell to, an to another actually looks like. And I'm just showing some of the events in which listeria is moving from one cell to another. And if you look really closely and something that other scientists have noticed is that listeria that have the tails actually resemble comets. And the way that we talk about them in science is actually by calling them actin comets. So that's why I see that I say that every time I take these images, I'm able to see hundreds of comets. Another really cool thing that we're able to do with the microscope in my lab is take movies of listeria as it moves from one cell to another. So here in yellow, I'm showing the outline of cells and in magenta, I'm showing listeria. And at the very top of the movie, you will see listeria having a very long yellow tail and that's essentially listeria dragging the outline of the human cell as it's trying to move. And you'll see that some of these bacteria actually have the ability to move through three cells in a matter of minutes. So there is tremendous amount of force that listeria is employing in order to make its way through our cells. You can imagine that our cells don't want a bacteria extending its membrane. Um, so listeria has different tools and techniques that allow it to do this. In order for me to be able to take these images, I have to be able to grow the human cells and the bacteria. 
the way that I do this is first you have to purchase these cells. So different companies will sell different types of cells and you can buy them. And once you have them in the lab, you can manipulate them and grow them. And you manipulate the human cells in something we call a cell culture hood or simply a hood. And this hood provides an environment that allows us to grow the human cell safely and doesn't allow things from the outside to get inside. After I grow the human cells, infect them and process them, I'm able to finally take the samples to the microscope room and image them. In the right image, I'm showing what the microscope room actually looks like. As you can see, the microscope has different parts. It's a very complicated system. And towards the right, you can see actually a computer screen showing one of the images that I have been showing earlier in the earlier slides. I mentioned earlier that I study how Listeria moves from one cell to another, as well as the resources that Listeria uses from our cells to be able to move. One of the machines or resources that Listeria steals is called Paxton 2. Paxton 2 is a machine that we find in our cells that actually I am studying. And so what I did was that I made some changes to the human cell and I managed to mark Paxson 2 with a green mark. So in the movie that I'm about to play, you're going to see Paxson 2 in green, and you're going to see Listeria in magenta. And essentially what I do with these movies is that I take them and then I spend countless of hours staring at them, trying to see if I can see any patterns that jump. And I want to do the same with all of you so I'm going to play the movie and I want you to pay very close attention to the green signal in relationship to the bacteria that are moving. So I'm going to play it, pay attention to the green signal. And I'm really curious to know if any of you can see something interesting happening with the green signal as Listeria is moving. So please put in your answers and then at the end, we're going to see if, if anyone was able to catch what is happening with the green signal. I'm going to stop the movie and then start it again. And I'm going to give you a little hint as to where this is happening. So we'll pay attention to the bacteria in this white circle and look at the green signal. And just describe what you're seeing. It doesn't have to be right. I'm re really curious to know if any of you can see anything interesting that pops up. Okay, so to summarize everything that I've talked about so far, some of the takeaways from today, let's read them together. One, Listeria is one of many bacteria that can cause food poisoning. Two, people can get sick from Listeria by eating food that has it. Three, once inside our body, Listeria can enter our cells. Four, Listeria can steal our cells' resources to survive and move from one cell to another. Five, by studying Listeria, we can learn about bacteria and about ourselves. And to conclude, I just want to tell all of you that you can be a scientist too. Doesn't matter your background. All you need in order to be a scientist is to be curious and be willing to ask questions. So by the end of this, I hope I was able to show all of you that bacteria are really cool to study. And I hope I was able to inspire some of you to be willing to ask questions about the world around you. So thank you so much for having me and I'll be happy to answer any of the questions that any of you have. Thanks, Jami. I'm gonna ask if you would be willing to replay that video for us one more time, just so that the students can have one last look at observing what happens in that circle and, and write in the chat um, what they're seeing. Yeah, of course. Let me go back to the slide. Okay, so I'm going to, sorry, show the circle and play the movie again. Thank you. I'm going to play it one more time because what you're supposed to see already happened. So one more time. 
pay attention to the green signal. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shami. Uh, I think that might be a, a good uh, way for us to kick off our Q&A. So uh, if you're willing, we can stop sharing our screens and kind of, of course. listen to some of the answers that the students have said. Okay, so I'm seeing a range of responses here. So I'm gonna read some of them out, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have some students saying that they see that Paxson is sticking to the listeria. Some of them are noticing that they have the comets forming that you showed us earlier. Um, it looks like a lot of the, one person is saying it looks like a lot of the listeria is moving towards the Paxson, like it wants to be there. Some people say it looks like a bullet. Some people say it looks like the Paxson itself is getting uh, smaller as more listeria goes through. Okay, yeah, and a lot more people saying they see the comments. So can you tell us what you're seeing, uh, Jamie? Also, can you tell us how many times you've looked at this video yourself before you realized what you were seeing? So I look at these movies, I've been looking at these movies for two years now, I think. So staring at these images and movies, I can pick up on patterns. So if I see signal being brighter in a specific movie compared to another region of the cell, I can eventually pick up that there's something going on there. So all of you are right. There are comments, comments there. They do look like bullets. Um, and I'm, you got a very good eye because I'm not including the actin in the movies and actin is usually what allows you to see the, the actin comments. So great eye. But what I actually wanted to you to notice, and I think someone mentioned it, is that yes, Paxson 2 seems to be sticking to the listeria. Um, but actually what's happening is that as the listeria is moving into cells, Paxson 2 moves towards the area where uh, listeria is trying to move. So it seems like somehow either Paxson 2 just goes to the area in response to Listeria moving, or Listeria somehow is attracting Paxson 2. So as of now, I don't know which one it is. We have in our lab, we've done other experiments that suggest that Listeria needs Paxson 2 in order to move from one cell to another. So this movie is like a really nice reassurance because it shows that yes, like actually as Listeria is moving, you can get packs into recruitment, that's what we say, packs into recruitment to the site where Listeria is moving. And another thing I didn't mention is that Listeria moving from one cell to another is called spread. So we call these spreading events. So it seems like packs two is being recruited to different spreading events. Got it, okay. Uh, well, I'm very impressed with the Nord Anglia students with all those observations. They got pretty darn close, so that's that's super. Maybe we have some future biologists, microbiologists in the call. I hope so. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Iha, and I think it it um, complements kind of what you just said. So Iha wants to know, you know, what are the resources that Listeria can steal? Uh, because you talked about actin, you showed us Paxin, and Iha's worried like, I mean, how many resources can they steal versus how many resources does a cell need to keep for itself so that it can still live? That's a great question. I love that question. So our cells are very complicated systems. Our cells have hundreds of different machines and um, it, they have a bunch of resources that allow us to stay alive. That being said, when Listeria is inside the cell, some of the things that it's able to steal are things like actin. So our cells use actin to maintain their shape. They also use actin to move. So Listeria knowing this is like, I'm gonna use this to develop a tail. Another thing that Listeria is able to steal is um, other machines that our cells have to transport things inside them. So our cells have many different things and they need to be able to organize these things. Um, so that's another type or example of machines or resources that Listeria is able to steal or hijack from the cells. Got it. And now we have a question from a Nord Anglia student who's wondering how quickly 
are these listeria actually moving? Are the videos you showed us sped up or are listeria actually that fast? That's a great question. Um, so in terms of the movies, the movies, the way that we take them is complicated. So the speed at which they're moving in the movie isn't actually realistic to how fast they can move. So we manipulate the movies. We tell the system, take these movies at X time. Um, and I modify them so that when you see the movies, it's clear to all of you um, what you're actually seeing. That being said, Listeria are very fast. So other scientists have done the math and they can move similarly to a submarine. So like in, in if you increase the size of Listeria to a submarine, like in comparison to that. So they're very, very fast um, and they're very, very good at what they do. Got it. And, you know, it seems like we you came into this research knowing a little bit about Listeria. And I'm wondering, you know, what brought you, Jami, to this? One of the students wants to know why do you want to know more about Listeria and what are things that you want to know about it going forward? Yeah, um, that's also a really good question. All of these are amazing questions. I'm very impressed. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I, since I was very young, was really interested in the why and the how of things. And for some reason, <laughs> studying really small things that we can't see really captured my attention. So that being said, when I learned about Listeria, I didn't know the full details of everything it can do. I was like, wow, this is a really cool way that I can learn both about bacteria and microbiology, which is the field that studies microorganisms, including bacteria. And I can also learn more about cell biology. I can learn more about our cells, about how cells live, their resources, the different machines that allow them to stay alive. So my reasoning was, by studying Listeria, I can study both things. So why not join a lab and start studying this phenomenon that allows me to be able to study both things? That's awesome. Well, I can relate to the attraction to studying really tiny things because I study <laughs> microscopic fossils. So I'm right there with you on that. Um, so now, uh, Jami, we have a question uh, from a Northern Anglia student and they're wondering, what color is Listeria actually? So you showed us these like fluorescently labeled that green, uh, or sorry, the pink in, in um, your videos, but like what color is it in real life? So they actually don't have, they're so tiny that they don't have a color. Um, the oh. way that we're able to, well, let me retract that. Listeria in the wild don't have color, but the ones that we have in the lab do. So people can manip manipulate Listeria and they can insert a little tiny molecule that we call a protein. And this protein has color to it. So there are proteins that are green, others that are blue. And in the case of some of the movies I was showing, the Listeria, because it has this small molecule, a small protein is actually green. And in other cases, some of the bacteria I was showing, um, they were blue. Um, the only thing is that because of the presentation, when I process these images and these movies, I can change the color of the bacteria. So in this case, I chose to make them magenta because it looks prettier and it's easier to spot them. Imagine if I had blue bacteria in a, you know, a black background, it's really hard to see them. So. Got it. Okay. So uh, we have a really uh, interesting question now um, from Adrian. Adrian says, you mentioned that Listeria affects women more commonly. Is it because of a different process when the bacteria affects the cells? Or is it just that, you know, women might be in more contact with the food that could be infected with Listeria? Yeah, um, I want to clarify, it's not women, it's pregnant women. So sorry, if I, that wasn't super clear. Um, the field still isn't 100% sure why. Um, I wish I could give you a question. I can give certain hypotheses that dive into the details. So Listeria has different machines also that allow it to get inside our cells. And one of the machines it has is specific to one of the structures where babies grow. Oh, so that could be one of the reasons. Um, I do know that for like the other groups that are also vulnerable to listeria, like 
older people or people who have weakened immune systems, the logic behind that is because our bodies have systems that help us fight off diseases. And so you can imagine if that system that helps you fight off diseases is weak, you're going to have a hard time fighting off different bacteria. So that's the reason why listeria particularly affects these groups. And as you get older, this, this system does get weaker. So that's like the logic or the explanation behind that. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So now we have a question from another non English student, and they're wondering, how does food become contaminated with bacteria such as listeria in the first place? That's another uh, really great question, like the question asked before. Um, so listeria can be found in soils and water normally. Um, but you can imagine that for food, it needs to be processed, right? So there are different tests that need to be done to ensure that food is good. Um, so if somewhere along the lines, the processing of food slips, so there's an error, error let's say someone is manipulating the food and they didn't wash their hands, for example, mm -hmm. um, that can cause uh, food to be contaminated by listeria. Um, there are other processes. So like there's pasteurized milk and there's unpasteurized milk. So in that case, pasteurized milk, it kills all of the microorganisms, it kills all of the bacteria. But if you have unpasteurized milk, it doesn't pass through that process. So that provides a higher chance for that to be the new home of listeria and have these um, cases where people get sick. Got it. And, you know, in these cases where folks do get sick, you know, they've they've eaten contaminated food and they were, uh, their immune system can't just fight it off as easily uh, as the next person's. Um, how do they know that it's specifically listeria that's making them, you know, have a tummy ache or a headache and feel sick and not a different kind of bacteria? That's a good question. Um, so the way that you know, let's say you, you have these symptoms, you go to the doctor, you're like, I'm not feeling good. The doctor's probably going to ask, did you eat something? You'll be like, yeah. Um, and then they'll probably take a sample from your body and try and grow that sample. So let's say they have a Petri dish, like the one I showed, they'll take that and they'll try to grow anything. And if they see that once they grow it, they're like, oh yes, like this thing that I see that grew is listeria. Then it's like, yes, you have an infection because of listeria. So that's like the way that we go about identifying any type of microorganism or bacteria causing an infection. Got it. And I think we have some folks who are interested in pathology and these um, potentially infectious bacteria. And they're wondering, what are some of the other bacteria that they could potentially find there? Um, are there other kinds of microbes that can give us food poisoning? Maybe if you could like name a couple. Yes. Um, <laughs> I laugh because they all have very complicated names, but I'm just going to drop two names that maybe you're familiar with. So one is E. coli and um, the other one is salmonella. So these are two different types of bacteria that can um, also cause food poisoning. Wow, got it. I, when I was in microbiology class back in the day, I actually worked with E. coli in the lab. So uh, I guess I've come in contact with it, but I hope to never get food poisoning from it specifically. <laughs> So something that I, I do want to add that I didn't mention in my presentation is that not all bacteria are bad. So actually the majority of bacteria that exist in the world are good for you. Bacteria are good for you. They allow you to be healthy. Um, so I do want to clarify that the bad bacteria are less. And in the case of E. coli, there are certain types of E. coli that aren't bad. I know it's complicated, but there are certain <laughs> types of E. coli that aren't bad. There are other types of E. coli that unfortunately make us sick. Got it. Okay. So in terms of this idea of good bacteria, um, when I'm eating yogurt and it says has healthy bacteria uh, in it, or it says probiotic, is that what the good bacteria means? Is that, is that yeah. what they're referring to? Got yeah. It. Yeah. So I mentioned that, um, you know, when you eat food infected with listeria, the food ends up in the gut and then listeria is able to get inside cells. In our gut, we have so many different bacteria. And they're really important because one of the functions that they do is that they actually help fight off bad bacteria, for wow. example. They're also good for nutrient, nutrient absorption. Um, and they have other functions that people are still studying because recently we've learned that 
the bacteria in the gut and in the body um, actually play a really important role in keeping us healthy. Wow. Okay. So we have good bacteria helping us out all the time in our own bodies. That's great. But we'll st still wash our hands when we go out because yeah. that's how we could get bad bacteria yeah. <laughs> in there. <laughs> Um, so we have a, a really interesting question uh, from a North Anglia student who's wondering, you know, does listeria mutate and could it become resistant to medications or, or treatments with time? And, and uh, yeah, is, is there a chance that food poisoning could become, you know, antibiotic resistant anywhere in the near future? Wow, well, that's, yes. Um, so yeah, there is, uh, you know, the, microorganisms are constantly changing and evolving and adapting. That's a very advanced uh, term. So I'm very surprised by that question. Um, so that is completely possible. A way that we can avoid that is that whenever you get sick, you get antibiotics. And doctors always say, finish your full course of antibiotics. So whenever someone tells you, finish all of the antibiotics, finish all of the antibiotics, because if you don't finish them, then that gives the bacteria an opportunity to become resistant to the antibiotics. And then it makes it really hard to fight them off when they eventually come again and make us sick. Got it. And can you tell us for those who um, haven't taken these medicines before, uh, what are antibiotics? So antibiotics are different compounds that can target bacteria and either kill them or stop their growth. So they target different machines inside the bacteria. Um, and in doing so, they help decrease the population of bacteria so that our immune system, the system we have in our bodies that helps us fight off diseases, can have a chance to clear out the bacteria. Got it. Okay. So uh, we can take antibiotics to help us clear up an infection by listeria. Um, and, and we have a question from Victoria that I think complements this really well. Victoria is wondering, how long does listeria actually live? How long can it last in, in our bodies? So that's, that's dependent on the type of person that gets it. So some people, you know, can have listeria, it passes through the body and it clears and you won't know it was there in the first place. Other individuals aren't as lucky. So um, again, it varies. So it can be weeks that you are fighting off the infection. Um, so it's, it's very dependent on the person. Got it. Okay. So as with most health related things, it's super individualized and it depends on your body specifically, but I'll say, hopefully it passes through and you never even know you had it. That's the best case scenario, right? And the best case scenario is also that your food didn't have it in the first place, I guess, right? Yeah. Tracking back. Yeah. We uh, also need big amounts of listeria to get sick. So, got it. okay. If, so uh, yeah, I was going to say, if food has like two bacteria in it or three, you won't get sick. Got it. Okay. So it's, it's you have to be exposed to a lot of it. Um, and that might make you sick. Yes. Got it. Okay. We have a, a student, a North English student who's asking a pretty cool question, in my opinion, something I've wondered myself. So you mentioned that you spend, you've spent two years looking at these videos, right? And, and now you've like, you can see what are the cool things to notice. You kind of pick up on things that you might not have picked up before because you have so much practice, but they're wondering, could you use like machine learning or computer science to help you identify those areas from the get-go, um, would that save you time? So I think the student is, is pretty advanced and they're wondering, you know, did you see those bright green parts in that video when they were bright all of a sudden? Um, can we use computers to pick those up for us? Yes, yes, you can definitely use computers to, to pick those patterns up. So there are certain programs that you can tell the program, hey, whenever you see this color, like magenta, you're going to create an outline surrounding it and you're going to determine how bright that area is in relationship to the exterior, like other parts of the cell. And if you see there's an increase, like if the, if the program sees that there is a significant increase, they can be like, oh, like there's enhancement in signal or whatever it is that you're trying to figure out. So yes, you can definitely do that. And there are programs in the lab that, that do that. Um, it's just as a first pass for these movies, I like to see them for myself just to be sure that whatever it is that the program is calling is true. 
is right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just a, a, a quick aside there uh, on my end. I took a computer science class for biologists last year, and we actually learned as one of our homework assignments how to write the computer program to identify those parts um, that people can use uh, in, in the images and say, OK, something weird is going on here because it's super different than what's going on in the rest of the images and videos. So that was probably my toughest homework problem set that I did. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really impressed that people are doing that every day. Um, we have a question from Avni, who's in grade three, and Avni's wondering, um, how do we know that there's like necessarily this, this bad bacteria in the food we eat in the first place? How are food scientists determining whether what we're eating is safe? That's a good question. So when you purchase food, unfortunately, it's hard to tell by just looking at the food. However, you can do things, implement practices to make sure that what you're eating is safe. So for example, washing your hands as much as possible. If you have something that needs to be refrigerated, making sure that that thing is refrigerated. In the case of milk and cheese products, being sure that that's pasteurized, not unpasteurized. Um, so those types of things. In the case of the different companies, some of the quality control steps taken is just, again, you can take a swab from the food and make sure that um, when you swab it, listeria doesn't grow. There are other markers that are quicker than just growing listeria. Um, so you can have sort of those or make do some of those tests to make sure that there is a listeria without necessarily growing it. Um, I can't go into too much detail because I'm not fully familiar with it, but that's the overview of how those things are done. Got it. Okay. So basically there are people who have the ability to test the food as it's being produced, you know, at, at factories or companies or before it reaches the grocery to determine that it is truly safe for yes. us to, to consume. That is very comforting. Okay. So we have a, a burning question from a known English student and they're wondering, you know, why MIT? I see we're both wearing our MIT gear. So we clearly love our school, but why here of all places to study this, Jami? It's a great question. Um, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, I was doing my bachelor's degree in microbiology, I did or had the opportunity to come here for a summer to work in another lab doing other type of research. So when it came time to choosing a school to do my PhD, I already knew MIT and I really liked the fact that there was a sense of community. The people were very smart, but they were also very nice. And I could have teachers that would allow me to grow and learn at my own pace. Um, and I had different friends here already because I had worked here. So that definitely helped me. I also really like Boston. I think Boston is a, a great city and it's very walkable and I enjoy walking, going to different restaurants. So it's a combination of the mentoring, my friends and the city. Got it. Yeah. Very similar reasons on, on my end. So now I wish I could keep asking you questions all day because I'm telling you, Nord Anglia students have asked some killer amazing questions today. Um, they're super duper curious, which is which is really lovely to see. But I'm gonna I'm gonna end with a, a very specific question. So I think based off of how detailed some of these questions have been and how forward thinking and advanced the biology has been that they've mentioned, I think that we have future microbiologists uh, who want to study. Uh, pathogens like listeria like you. And, and I'm wondering, what are some of the good qualities that these students can cultivate in the rest of their educations to do the kind of work you do? That's a great question. Um, so mainly be curious, be curious about the world around you and be willing to ask questions. And I mean that in, in all sorts of aspects of your life. So if you don't understand something and you think, oh, maybe this is a, a question that isn't worth asking, probably is worth asking. Probably someone else in the room also doesn't understand what was just said or explained. Um, so be willing to ask questions, be curious, and be willing to, you know, put in the work and the effort. Um, but I'd say curiosity and be willing to ask questions are, are the two main things. Got it. All right. So there you have it. Be curious. Be curious, North Anglia students. Now, Yami, I'm going to quickly share my screen and, and tell students about what's coming up next in the abstracts series. So 
Next month, we're going to be speaking to Yun Choi, and she's a PhD student in MIT's Tangible Media Group at the MIT Media Lab. And she's going to be talking about STEAM, and that's the culmination of science and art. So for all of you creative students and science lovers, definitely tune into this one. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and now I'd like to also say that you know these, these talks are recorded, these webinars are recorded. So if you can't make it to Yun's or you want to re-listen to Jami's amazing talk, Talk and learn more about the biology and take notes. Um, the recordings will be posted on Global Campus as well as YouTube. So be sure to check them out. And now to, to end our show, I'd like to just thank our sponsors, uh, the MIT Nord Anglia Education uh, and MIT Collaboration uh, for making this series possible and for giving us the opportunity to bring folks and biologists like ja uh, Jami straight to uh, your screens wherever you are around the world. And I want to also extend a huge thank you to Jami for sharing all of your science with us and for giving us such uh, illuminating answers today. Mm -hmm.